Holy cow. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to another Monday on the Eagles Nest Podcast. I'm Vince Duvall with Coldwell Baker Realty. I'm Brad Brewer. Also, those things that Vince said, and as always, much, much more. Or yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, happy Monday. What is it? August 5th? We're in August. August, man. The year is, uh, geez, half, three quarters almost over, right? We're in our, we're in our third quarter. Part of me feels like it's been the longest summer ever. Part of me feels like it's flying by. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you've had a lot going on over the last couple of weeks. So I think it's a little it a, a little more trying for you. So, yeah. Um, the, this morning, you know, we, Brad and I talked yesterday. I was like, hey, what are we going to talk about this week? This is kind of how we fly by the seat of our pants sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Brad's like, let's talk about mortgage rates. Holy crap, have they dropped? They really dropped. Um, I mean, we're talking, we'll get into the weeds on a little bit, but. Um, Vince actually put up my screen. We have we have 15 year fixed is in the fives, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, uh, 5.89. That's this is national average, by the way. Yep, 30 year uh, fixed is 6.4. Actually, that's come down again because it was it ended last week at like 6. Point well, that that's from six, this is from last Friday. Is it from last? Okay, yep. it yep. must have been Thursday. I thought I saw it 6.6 something, yeah, 6.67 at the last week. Okay, which means it's uh. Continue to go down. And even last week, I talked to a lender um, that was quoting out 6.3 at the time when the average was at 6.6. So uh, there could be some conventional mortgage opportunities right near at six, potentially right under points and all that good stuff, which talk to your lender. Yeah, I actually uh, had a lender that uh, got one of our buyers at six and a quarter recently. So, yeah. There, there's a lot of opportunity out there if you're looking at buying, but I will tell you. So I just looked back at this national average. They have a little graph going for us, and we kind of see the last time we were below the 6.4 that we are right now was April 3rd, 2023. So a year and a half ago almost, wow. we were the national average was below the 6.4. So that tells you that we're starting to see you know some fluctuation there now. Obviously, it went up, and now it's coming back down. That is pretty typical across the board here. Uh, but with that being said, <laughs> what that means for our market today and how that's going to change things as rates drop, mm-hmm. it gives buyers what? Well, it gives a couple things. On the buyer side, it gives buyers um, some of their affordability back. Yep, more buying power. I call it buying power. Buying power to purchase purchase a home at a higher price, whether that be in a situation where you're dealing with a multiple op situation that you're having to compete a little bit. Yep. Or just raising your budget a little bit. Um I threw some this is real rough numbers, but just between when we were, I don't know when we were last at seven percent, but um uh-huh. I went six point four, which is the national so point six percent difference essentially, not even a whole interest rate was over a hundred dollars on a three hundred thousand dollar loan. So I use a three hundred thousand dollar loan as an example. So just a basically a half a percent difference. Five weeks ago, by the way, we were just okay. over. That's over a hundred dollars a month. What does that equate to? From like, okay, well then my pre approval or my buying power is at three forty, three fifty. There's some calculations that you'd have to get involved with with your lender on that, right? But that could be meaning like you could afford maybe a ten thousand dollar more home. Twenty thousand dollars, you know, more more in a home. That that's half percent can be big. Yes, yeah. so that's a huge. I mean, that's a huge jump in your buying power. Also, it gives you a little more room to negotiate. I think is the, the key here. But what it also is telling us is for those buyers that are like, oh, I'm gonna wait for wait rates to drop. I'm not gonna buy at seven percent. Well, that's bringing more buyers out of the woodwork. That's you know creating more competition for you as a as a buyer that's already out there and been looking for a while while, and it's giving sellers potentially more offers in front of them, with more to choose from, potentially higher prices, more money down, different different things. So, you know, is it good when rates drop? Sure, if you land the right house. Yeah. But as a buyer that's been competing with other buyers for a while, it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean. Interest rates going down, I'd say overall it's a positive. Is it how great a positive is it? There's variables there. Yep. I think that's going to be a conversation with your lender. Just talk crunching the numbers. 
obviously then then having the conversation with your agent we hope that's of course us uh <laughs> well little plug for Eagle Homes team there um I will say this too it, it we're really trying to focus on the buyer side today on these benefits there's benefits to the seller side too which also helps the buyer yeah one of the things right now that's still kept inventory I think lower than I think it would have. I think inventory would have increased this year and sellers would have started to sell if they weren't being like, oh my God, I got to give up my 4% interest rate or three and a half percent or three and a quarter, whatever, for seven, seven, seven and a half by buy, go buy a new home. That was keeping some sellers that for other life reasons, upsize, downsize, divorce, whatever. I mean, some of that stuff doesn't change regardless of interest rates. But, right. Um, it was preventing some, some of the homes in the market. Yep. So this actually helps buyers too because this could create more inventory. Yeah. Now there's a challenge there that comes with it because again, there's been some buyers sitting on the sideline, buyers sitting out there that because inventory is still kind of low. So, but it's I think interest rates coming down probably into the mid to high fives is going to be a positive. Yeah, I think so too. Now, don't get excited. By the way, we're not seeing threes and fours. We're not maybe ever. But let's talk about those those potential homeowners that have a three or four percent interest rate. You refinanced your house three years ago when rates dropped. Yeah. You refinanced to a thirty back to a thirty year mortgage. And let's say you were already ten years into your home, right? Yeah. You went from having twenty years of paying at five and a half percent to thirty years paying at three percent. Maybe your payments came down a little bit, but if you look at the amortization table, you're probably still paying a little more than what you were going to pay if you stuck with it for 20 years instead of 30. Now, here's the trick. You sell today when homes values are still above where they were three, four, five years ago, or even 10 years ago when you bought, you have all this equity. You now go from a 30-year a mortgage potentially to a 15-year mortgage, get more house, and still maybe a similar payment. Exactly. So there's ways to work around it. Don't look at the big picture. Figure out, you know, talk to a lender, figure out how you can make that happen. Absolutely. If you have a goal and you see a house out there, you want a location change, whatever yeah. it might be, there's opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, I'll, not, not to sound, well, to go from the opposite side, sometimes I think you're like, man, I wish they would go back and I'm three and a half. I don't know that three and a half, four percent is technically the healthiest overall economy. I think... I mean, you got to remember, five percent, five six percent are really, really good mortgages if you look at the history of time. Right. You know, especially the last fifty years, we we we've thrown out those stats in the past. We will not bore you with them this morning. But I think if you did look at, uh, quickly, if you did take a look at half the year, yep, you are looking at probably, or excuse me, the last fifty years, the average is in the six and a half seven percent range. So we're going to be back below. 50 year average, which is amazing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's, but now with that being said, there's some changes that are coming out there for buyers in the next week. We got 12 days before these changes are actually implemented, right? Yeah, uh, you know, and I've seen a lot of mixed feelings. Gosh, if you're following social media, the news, you know, I, I highly recommend that you talk to an experienced agent. If you are thinking about buying and you ask that agent, you know, I've been hearing in the news, seeing on social media about these NAR changes. How's that going to affect me? If that agent goes, I don't know, it's not happening yet. It doesn't happen for another week. <laughs> Run. Because if that agent doesn't know what's happening, then we have some issues. Yeah. Um, why don't you give a, want to give a quick um, brief, maybe like just the simplest, how I've, it's going to change real quick. I know we covered this two weeks ago. Yeah, I think the simplest thing to say uh, when it comes to the buyer side of things is, you now are going to have to commit to working with an agent. You're going to have to sign a piece of paper that says, hey, I'm willing to work with Brad here for this one house. And you can do it for a single home. You can do it for just the agent to open the door for you. You can do it for, you know, I want Brad to find me that home. And if it takes three, six months, whatever it might be, that's what it's going to take. I, I'm using you, Brad. I'm committing to this. Now, that's change one. I think there's four different forms, correct? Correct. Depending on... Depending on your state. Okay, let's, your state. let's make that very okay, clear. Your state. So yep. Wisconsin and four. Illinois is different. Um, there's four. But basically, I I kind of feel, and you can please correct me on this because I've been a little bit out of the last week, staying 100% up to date on these. 
but it's like the rangers are basically open the door yep find you a or the one that's work with you on a specific home yep or there's like that full representation that's that you we're going to look to find you any home whatever it is correct um for so you're going to hire us as your agent for uh x period of time it's usually x period of time or up until we secure you that new home yep be. yeah yeah and i and so really in wisconsin that hasn't changed a lot we've always had buyer agency agreements now Here's the other changes coming for the buyers. And this is where an agent, an experienced agent is going to know how to negotiate this into the contract for you. Um, and that is us as agents knew what we were going to get paid from helping you find a specific home. We knew that the listing was going to pay 2.4%, 2.5%, 3%. Um, now you as a buyer is going to, you're going to come to an agreement with your agent and say, hey, I'm willing to pay you. 2%, 2.4%, 3% to help me to help me find a home. Now, the trick is if the seller is going to offer that as compensation, because they can still offer it, it's just not publicized on the MLS. Yep. It will be it can be publicized on uh individual brokerages websites, which I think is kind of asinine. I, I don't understand why we're gonna take it off the MLS, but we still can put it in another spot, right? Like I don't, I, and that's just me. I don't quite understand the logistics of why we can do one but not the other. I think if we, I think if most agents, I will I've, find the answer to that today, though. I've spoke very openly about this. Of, I have no issue. Actually, I think a lot of the changes are good. Yeah, I think the not advertising the commission part is probably the obviously stupidest part about it. I think I just think it's it's ridiculous. Uh, I think there's a lot. Of, there's actually more to me. There's more positives to. To doing that i think it's more open it's um i don't think it takes away from fair and reasonable comp like uh, competition right because what you, you as a seller what you choose to offer a buyer's agent to help also sell your home along with all the marketing that your listing agent's doing right is a that's what you want so i i feel like there's more positives than negatives to this so that's one of the rules i don't really I'm not saying don't really, I don't agree with. Yeah. So, you know, at that point in time, you as a buyer, if you're looking at a home with your agent and that listing is offering a compensation, fine. We're getting paid by the seller. Yeah. If that listing is not offering a compensation upfront, we then negotiate it in as a seller concessions. Okay. Now, as a buyer, depending on your loan, you know, if you're VA, if you're FHA, if you're conventional, you're only allowed X amount of dollars in seller concessions. So we're going to have to figure that out and work that through. Um, and the last part is if we can't negotiate in the contract, then you as the buyer um, will have to negotiate with your agent on how they're going to get paid. And that is, you know, are you going to you know, be able to pay them out of how much money you have saved up? Are you are we going to be able to wrap it into the loan? If you're VA, they're talking about wrapping it into loans. Yeah. Uh, so there's different ways that we can, we can negotiate it for you. We just, you have to work with us and we're going to be working with the seller's agent to figure that out. Uh, but don't be discouraged on looking for that home because of this. There's ways we can do it. Yeah. It's uh, based in, from the marketing perspective. It's just, you can, we can pretty much put the commission that the seller's offering the buyer's agent anywhere except for the MLS. Yep. Well, I've seen some pretty cool, cool creative <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Do you see the do you see the lockbox one? Yeah, the lockbox one. And you open up the lockbox, there's a the key holder in it that says three percent, two point four percent. All right, at least I know. Or that one, that one made me chuckle. Or or the one that says, "Hey, my listing is going to be listed at two hundred thousand and three dollars. My listing is going to be two hundred thousand and two dollars. Yeah. So if my listing ends in a three or two or a three point two or a two point four, you know what that commission is. Yeah. And this, uh, and I think uh, all these changes in MLS take place next Wednesday. Is the seventeenth. I thought our MLS was doing it on the fourteenth, though. I'll we'll check on this. Yeah, I mean maybe they're getting pulled out at a certain date, but they everyone has to be compliant by the seventeenth. Got it. Or on the seventeenth, one of those two dates. So yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So. But as, a, but as a buyer, you're really going to have no clue. You're not going to know. You never saw what that was previously. No. We just talked about it, and it was just an open conversation. Now, 
if a listing agent, I will tell you this, or if a buyer's agent decides to tell you, hey, Brad, I'm, I can't show, I'm not going to show you that house. It's not offering compensation. Well, no, that is against our ethic code. Mm -hmm. We still have to show you that home. We then have to decide how we're going to negotiate those terms. Right. Okay. Just because it's not offering compensation doesn't mean they won't. I mean, the, if the house is right, the house is right. You know, we can work on figuring out how to make that happen. Yeah. So because it's not offering compensation, we can't say we're not showing it to you. That's against our code of ethics. That's considered steering, not allowed. So if an agent tells you that, uh, beware. And and we have seen before the laws in the back, we've already seen uh, come across the couple in MLS that the commission in MLS said zero, but yep. there were notes in there that said negotiable, which basically just means come in and offer you and know, ask for your normal 2.4, right. 2.5, 3%, 2%, whatever you want to do. It just becomes part of the negotiations, which is fun. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're, uh, it, the changes are coming. Change is good. Uh, it's just, it, it it's going to take a while for everyone to get on board and figure it out and have those open and honest conversations. So we're, we're getting closer. Uh, but that's happening in just over a week. Uh, so we're uh, looking forward to see how that really affects us. And we can move forward from that. Or actually, t our team is getting some training this afternoon or after this meeting, after our podcast here, is getting some live training on it. Yep. Uh, a lot of them have already done some different webinars with that, uh, with our Wisconsin Association, with our home offices. So uh, our agents on our team are definitely becoming more knowledgeable in it. They're figuring out how to talk about it, how to you know negotiate it in. So there's a lot of opportunities here, and it's going to we're going to build on it. So I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. You know, one la you know, one more thing we wanted to talk about today, and I, I think it's huge, and uh we could talk about live experiences a little bit, possibly, maybe. Okay. Uh, but it's home safety. I, I think every year around <clears throat> this time, maybe a little bit later, but I think uh the timing is kind of relevant. Um uh, but different ways to prepare your home uh for different events, whatever it might be. Um uh, and one of gosh, I had a dream last night and kind of talks about home safety is mm -hmm. let left. I woke up this morning. The door was unlocked. My back door is unlocked. And we live in a very rural area. So never concerns me, but I woke up and my house was trashed. <laughs> I mean, this was your dream. This was my dream. Uh, but it wasn't true. Yeah, no, me too. Like TV was missing. Well, what was funny was my TV in my living room was missing, but they replaced it with a, like a 1960s tube TV, like the heaviest black and white tube TV you can imagine. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. But it, one of the things that I keep in my bedroom, and I have these, I have the basement, my bedroom, and the kitchen is a fire extinguisher. And everyone's like, why do you keep one in your bedroom? Well, when I did a lot of fire safety training, they, you know, they said, hey, if, you, if there's a fire in your room or in your hallway, you need to be able to get to your kids. You need to be able to get through. So having a fire extinguisher there is great. The other thing is someone breaks into your house, you spray them with a fire extinguisher, they're not going to be able to see crap, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's probably going to blind them a little bit or hurt them a little bit. It's a great home defense system. <laughs> yeah. And then when they can't see, you just hit them with the fire extinguisher. I mean, I'm hoping they don't have a gun and they just start shooting randomly. But yeah, um, I mean, there's at least the percentage there they could miss. Yeah, there there is. With a fire extinguisher, you get a wide spray. So you got a, a chance. The other thing I have heard people talk about for at least home safety in that sense is carry a can of wasp spray. For those that don't aren't familiar, wasp spray shoots about 20 to 25 feet. So you can keep your distance and still potentially hit somebody. Uh, but have a fire extinguisher in my kitchen, my bat, my basement, and my master bedroom. Not only for you know a break-in, but if there's a fire in my house, I have it easily accessible. Uh, maybe, I mean, kitchen fires are the number one place that fire starts in a home. Uh, because people don't understand how to put out a grease fire. Mm -hmm. They just throw water on it, and all that does is spread it. Um, so that is, you know, my one tip is if you don't have a fire extinguisher in A, and the only reason I say my bedroom, the kitchen, and the basement is we're on a ranch. All levels of your home, you should have some type of fire extinguisher, along with working smoke detectors. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I guess I can speak to the fire thing. <laughs> so... Uh... I wasn't. I didn't ask him to speak to it. I just figured. I will. Uh, some people out there will know. Some will. Uh, we did have a small uh, basement fire a week ago in our house. Uh, it was the dehumidifier. 
So a couple things, dehumidifiers this year with the amount of rain you've had have been working probably in excess of which they would normally work. Um, ours also has a recall on it. We're, we're, we'll be diving into that to see what's going on with that. If there's anything that comes from that um, as a kind of a, basically a bad dehumidifier. Um, so we did not have any fire extinguishers. Honestly, didn't really think about it. Haven't thought about it. I've had them in some homes. It's usually because when they bought the home, they've had them. Mm, yeah. Uh, whether we rented a home, bought a home, whatever. A lot of ours have had them. Some haven't. It's just not one of those things you think about. Um, I actually got most of the fire out. It was very small. This fire damage itself is minimal. Um, smoke damage caused a little bit more. All in all, very lucky. Uh, we were home. If we wouldn't have been home. Uh, been uh, worse. We may have lost four animals and much more of the house because right. the response time would have been obviously greater. Kudos to the city of Burlington Fire Department, by the way, they were there in seven minutes. That's impressive. Batch. So that was pretty impressive. Granted, yes, we do the like six blocks. <laughs> but still, um, that is an impressive, that's a really impressive response line. The police were there, of course, even faster because they're out patrolling. Um uh, I had it out with a bowl of water. Now, one of the things, like, I just went to reaction mode. A bowl of water? Yeah, I kept filling the bowl of water and dousing it. Um, How big was this bowl? I don't know. Yeah. It was not bad. I grabbed it from the kitchen. It was probably, like, okay, you know, all right, big. Um, I don't know if that tells anybody visually, but Again. probably uh, probably held a gallon. Yeah. Maybe water. Um, But one of the things I didn't think of was that it was down in the laundry room where the dehumidifier was, right next to the furnace. We had towels in there. If I really would have thought I would have just taken one towel, soaked the heck out of it, because that's what they tell you to do. If I was just would have thrown it over top, they would have been done. Probably. That was it. I mean, I did. I got it out quickly. Definitely mitigated a whole heck of a lot of additional damage that could have been done. But if you don't have fire extinguishers, there's there's things like that, including not with water, but grease fire. Um, so same thing. Yeah, basically the same thing. Just get the towel really, really wet and throw it over the grease fire to exist because you're cutting off its oxygen. Right. And it's got something that's damp and cooled. So it's not going to catch on fire again, right? It's, the fire is going to go out and dissipate before that soaking wet towel catches yeah. on fire. So, Gre grease fire is baking, so it also works yes. wonders. Um, yeah. So know where your know where your grease fire is named, know where your baking soda is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. usually a lot, I know a lot of people is it's just sit in the fr freezer. Yep. Uh, don't stick it in the back. Uh, I'll be first to admit ours is sticking in the back. Uh, granted, I'd have to remove my ice tray <laughs> and grab it. It would take like no time, but that's I do know where mine's at. Yeah. So if yeah. it would, it wasn't the grease fire first. So when we talk about different uh, home safety, I think uh, two big things, man. For those that don't clean your lint traps in, in your dryer, yeah, clean them on a regular basis. Like we have a habit of changing it every time we change our dryer or you know change our clothes in our dryer. The other thing is once or twice a year, I'd say twice a year, clean out your the tube that the, that goes outside of your house from your dryer. That does, even though you have a lint trap in there, lint gets into that thing. It gets clogged up. I mean, you can see it. I bet you if you walk outside, if you haven't looked in a while because it's in an area you don't go to, if you look at where your dryer vents out of your house, I will bet money on it. You can see lint's on the ground right there and that tells me that that tube is collecting lint mm -hmm. right and it's blowing it out so get that get that tube cleaned out all the way pull it out take it off they make these really cool brushes uh, they're about the size of the tube you stick it in there you pull it in and out a few times and it cleans lint out of that tube it really does help you know that's, prevent is that accessible in the back or the front side of the dryer it might depend on the dryer right well, it's on the back side of the dryer 99.9% .9 of the time. You do have to take it off. It's usually like a hose clamp okay. with either a, a screwdriver, screwdriver or a nut, nut on it. Um, I've, I've cleaned mine out, but it was because I was had to access something. Maybe the, it was getting repaired or serviced or something. And that's usually when I do it. But it's dryers are really light. These oh, yeah. The newest ones, the older ones, just they slide out very easily. I don't know, probably every six months to a year. I don't know what's common for that, but. Well, and I would say too, one way to tell that it starts to go is if you're used to throwing a load of laundry in and it takes 30 minutes to dry, all of a sudden you pull it out and it's not dry. It's because it doesn't have that air circulating through. So 
you know, I first I got to check is your lint trap and then check that tube. And I would bet money. I'm a gambling man, as many of you know. I would bet money on it that that thing is, is dirty. As many of you know. Also, all the way to the exterior, so depending on how some of your the vents that out go to the exterior, you know, they've got um, they've got basically kind of like not screens. It's not screens, but they've got correct um, basically little squares, which if you get start getting big chunks of lint coming up through there, it just builds up over time and blocks those. That that happened a lot of my daughter's house. And I just I could like Ben said, you can tell, like, man, this seems to be taking longer to dry. Right. It should. And every single time I would go outside, pop that off, and remove like a about a handful of size of lint. All of a sudden, the magic dryer works amazingly again. No, no, no $100 service call. Right. So. I mean, nothing's worse than calling your uh, the dryer repair guy and go, uh, dryer's not dry. Can you come out and look at it? And they're like, yeah, sure. I'll come out and clean your lint trap and the tube out for you for a $100 visit. And, and don't feel bad because the first time you discover that that happens on occasion, by the way, I also had the $100 service call for the guy to come out and say, yeah, I pulled this out. Oh, okay. Thanks. So, you know, a couple other quick tips before we cut out here today. Uh, for those that have uh, fireplaces, natural fireplaces, uh, even gas fireplaces, get them checked out on a regular basis. I know people that do them once a year. Some do them once every two years, depending on how much you use it. Including a chimney clean, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. That's where I was going was chimney clean. Even gas things. fireplaces, you get that, that build up. Yep. Yeah. You get a little bit of build up, but more from a natural fireplace, you get that soot build up in there. And some people are like, oh, I could just use a soot log. Do that. You burn off, and it's supposed to clean the soot out of your out of your chimney. Those don't always work. Okay, they they get some of it, but it still builds up. Uh, I highly recommend for 100, 150 bucks, have them come out, clean your chimney, inspect it. Nothing worse is nothing is worse than a chimney fire. Always great to do it come this time of year, September, October, when it's starting to get cold, and you're going to start using it because I will tell you it, one of the things if you don't use it a lot that love to nest up there are squirrels and birds. And if you get a bird's nest up there and that stuff your smoke cannot escape, yeah. you're either gonna have a fire or you're gonna have smoke just barreling back into your house. So get it checked out early fall. Uh it's probably the best time. The other thing smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. Yeah. Uh the rule of thumb is when you change your clocks change the batteries in your smoke detectors. Very smart. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very simple to kind of remember. I'm changing clocks, change batteries, and smoke detectors. A lot of people are like, ah, it's a smoke detector. It's it's going to work forever. So that has a 10-year life, shelf life. That's the smoke detector. That's not the battery that's in the smoke detector. Absolutely. Um, and then the, one last thing I want to talk about is sump pumps. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of you out there have sump pumps in your basement and have battery backups. Now, I've talked to a lot of inspectors, and they're like, well, battery backups are great if you're going to check your battery and change your battery once a year, once every year, right. other year. Those batteries, even though they're plugged in, they're supposed to be on like a trickle charge. They don't they don't last that long. So just because you have a battery backup, you have to make sure that battery is still working on a regular basis. So yeah. unplug your sump pump, see if the battery backup kicks in. Yeah. And, and or a lot of you probably more than likely have your sump pump plugged into a GFCI outlet. Trip the GFCI outlet, see if the battery backup kicks in. If it does, you're good to go. If it doesn't, you have a battery issue. Yeah. Um, so there's just some small things you know, when it comes to home, home ownership, home safety, that I find are very valuable that people forget about, that neglect. I, would, I wouldn't say forget about it. I'd say they neglect it more than anything else. I, I mean, forget's fair. I mean, yeah. I mean, I forget, we all forget those certain things. I like what Vince said about tying certain things into other things. Like, you know the clock's got to be changed because is unless you have a super technologically advanced, all your appliances are somehow on Wi-Fi that automatically change. They don't. They don't do the daylight savings. So, right. And the federal government hasn't passed that hasn't changed. So while we still have daylight savings, <laughs> um, use that to remind you to do certain things that should be probably be done once or twice a year. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, it's nine. It's a little after nine thirty. Thank you for everyone that uh, joined us today. I'm Vince Duvall with Eagle Homes and the Eagles Nest Podcast, and I'm Brad Brewer. Have a great week, everybody, and we will see you uh, next week. Bye, everyone.